Hello and welcome to Getting Started with Apercept AWS SDK for Delphi. I'm Richard Hatherall from Apercept. I'm the author of the AWS SDK and I'm an Embarcadero MVP for Delphi. Let's uh, take a quick tour of the general features first before we uh, see any code um, so we know exactly what the Apercept AWS SDK provides. Uh, there is a QR code in the top corner, which is a link to the package on GetIt. Uh, if you are an enterprise or architect uh, subscriber to Delphi or Rad Studio, uh, you will have access to the Appcept AWS SDK um, uh, already. The uh, SDK is built on top of uh, Delphi's uh, HTTP uh, client layer from system net HTTP client. Uh, the benefit of this is it's compatible with all Delphi supported target platforms. So you can deploy to um, Windows, Linux, Mac OS, iOS, Android, um, and it should uh, work equally well on each of those platforms. Uh, it provides direct mapping for all features of the implemented services, so you can uh, you can do anything in the in the Delphi SDK that you would in Amazon's own SDKs. Um, so we don't hide anything away from you. Uh, it, there are uh, features built on top to make certain things easier, but uh, but you always have access to the. Uh, service features directly. We honor the AWS configuration. So Amazon's own SDKs and command line tools um, have a standardized way of storing and loading configuration. And that comes in the form of shared files, environment variables, uh, platform services. So as best as possible, uh, we uh, honor those uh, configurations. This allows you to exist or coexist within an environment that's already configured for Amazon Web Services. We provide automatic credential resolution. Uh, so uh, as a part of that configuration, there are uh, defined locations to find uh, credentials um, and we uh, load those uh, in the in the same order effectively as uh, as an AWS SDK uh, would do. Um, we uh, provide automatic credential refreshing. So if you're issued expiring credentials uh, that are refreshable, uh, we will automatically refresh those credentials for you. So you don't have to deal with that. We have scoped exceptions. So we provide a, uh, a hierarchy of exceptions allowing you to um, uh, handle errors at whichever level that you need to. Um, uh, we'll talk more about that later. We uh, uh, Some exceptions are marked as retriable and those exceptions we will automatically retry based on a policy um, and uh, that policy can be uh, adjusted slightly. We'll talk about that later. Uh, we, we provide convenient utility classes to help you perform complex or asynchronous actions or build complex data structures. Uh, so there are times that some requests will need um, uh, multiple actions um, chained together to, to do a, uh, uh, a, an overall action that you're looking for. So, so we, we provide um, some utilities that help those actions. We also provide component, uh, components for FMX and VCL. Uh, it was a couple of months ago now we released our first components um, for um, uh, Cognito. We have a T Cognito hosted UI <coughs> component available for FMX and VCL. Uh, there's more coming uh, soon. So, uh, Let's have a look at the supported services. Um, within the application integration category, we provide Amazon Simple Notification Service, or SNS. Um, this is a PubSub mechanism, allows you to uh, send out notifications to 
uh, consumers of of those topics. Um, you can send messages to um, mobile platforms using the Apple push notification service or the Firebase cloud messaging uh, through a, a common interface um, with SNS. Uh, you can uh, send uh, send messages or uh, uh, you can queue messages um, for consumption by uh, distributed components with Amazon Simple Queue Service, SQS. Uh, in the business applications category, we provide Amazon Simple Email Service, which is uh, a service that, uh, as its name suggests, uh, allows you to uh, send and receive emails, um, typically used for um, sending templated emails from platforms. Uh, it has uh, a lot of features to help you manage templated emails and things like that. Um, cryptography and PKI category, we have the AWS Key Management Service, KMS. Uh, this is a service that uh, can uh, create and store uh, uh, cryptography keys uh, to be used by other Amazon Web Services. Uh, so uh, many of the other services we're talking about here will make use of cryptography at, at some point, and they typically use the key management service uh, for the cryptography keys. Uh, within the machine learning category, uh, we provide Amazon Poly, uh, which is a text-to-speech service. So you can provide it a uh, uh, some text and it will send you back an MP3 file, uh, which is uh, which will contain uh, some uh, uh, a, a voice uh, recording or uh, generation uh, that is very human-like. Um, and then uh, there's Amazon Textract, which is a service for extracting text from non-textual documents like images. So uh, you um, can, if you have a photograph and in that photograph there is um, uh, some text contained in it, uh, Textract can, can uh, extract that text for you. Uh, it also has some handy uh, uh, actions to help you extract text specific to financial documents as well, like invoices. So you can ask, ask it to uh, extract all of the financial information from that document and it will give you a, uh, a breakdown and summary of that. Amazon Transcribe uh, is used for transcribing uh, voice um, uh, out of uh, audio or video files. So you can get it to generate a, a text transcript or a, uh, a set of subtitles um, uh, from, uh, from that, uh, the audio that you provide. Amazon Translate uh, is for translating to and from any of the supported uh, languages on Amazon Translate. Uh, I can't remember how many there are now, but there's quite a few. Um, and then in the security, identity, and compliance category, uh, we support Amazon Cognito. Uh, so Amazon Cognito uh, is a service we'll take a look uh, in more detail in a later um, uh, talk within uh, Decoding Bootcamp. Uh, it's a service um, that uh, allows you to uh, implement uh, authentication services um, within your application very easily. Uh, it, you can generate identity uh, providers um, and, uh, uh, and have uh, identities federated from uh, third party providers like social platforms as well. Um, so you can have people sign into your apps using their Facebook uh, or Google credentials, for example. Um, Amazon uh, AWS Secrets Manager is a uh, cryptography um, uh, or cryptographic secrets uh, manager. So you can ask it to safely store you a, uh, uh, a value and it will store that away and you can later retrieve it. Um, it also has some uh, capabilities for um, general cryptography as well. 
Uh, there's the AWS Security Token Service, STS. Uh, this is really a, a core part of the AWS SDK. Um, uh, you you rarely ever interact with it directly, but it's uh, it provides um, a lot of uh, the functionality uh, when dealing with credentials. Um, then in the storage category, we support last but not least the Amazon Simple Storage Service S3. So this is probably the most well-known uh, and and most used services of AWS. Uh, it allows you to store terabytes of data uh, in the cloud um, and uh, provides uh, lots of uh, features for interacting and uh, and archiving and uh, versioning and all kinds of, uh, of things that you would likely want to do with uh, data in the cloud. Uh, so um, let's uh, let's move on now and have a look at how we actually make uh, use of some of these services. Uh, so this listing here uh, um, is for a, a program list S3 buckets and I've just highlighted in it the key areas within the program. Uh, so the important thing when we're using uh, a one of the AWS services is we import the unit that we need. So all we need to do is import the specific unit. In this case on line nine, you'll see aws.s3, we're importing uh, the S3 client. And uh, the uh, we then on line 14, we define a variable S3, which is an interface to the S3 client, IS3 client. And uh, in on line 19, we, uh, we instantiate uh, a, an implementation of that, the TS3 client. So each each service will have uh, an interface to it and the implementation of it. Uh, I I prefer to generally uh, uh, use the interface um, uh, or define the variable as the interface. It just allows me not to have to remember to put in a try finally to clean up. Uh, the resources you've used there, um, and it just makes the the code look a bit uh, a bit cleaner because uh, interfaces are automatically managed from a memory point of view. Um, but the uh, if if you if you want, you can feel free and put in your own try finally blocks and just use TS3 client uh, on its own. There's nothing to stop you doing that. Um, but um, uh, then on line 22, we have um, uh, we have a call to the S3 client for list buckets, and we're storing the response of that. Um, so that will that will contain all of the results of the uh, of the response. Um, now on uh, line 25 to 29, we'll see there. We're actually using the response. We're we're iterating over the list of buckets that are returned to us, um, and we're outputting them to the uh, to the console. Um, and uh, if I uh, show you what that would look like, it looks exactly like if you if you if you're familiar with Amazon's command line tools, this would be the equivalent of doing AWS S3 LS um, to list. Uh, the buckets within your account. Um, uh, if we uh, if we look back at the code, there's a little note down here on line 34. Don't forget to handle service exceptions. And on line 35, we are catching specifically the ES3 exception class, which is any exception that is raised specifically by the S3 client. Uh, so if it's not an S3 exception, it will it will be caught by the uh, by the next um, exception handler on line 38. Um, so there's no difference here, but it may be that you want to handle exceptions for S3 different to how you would handle a general application exception in your code. Um, so uh, that's why we provide uh, a, a, an exception hierarchy like this. So let's look at how to configure 
the AWS SDK. Um, the QR code in the uh, on the top of the screen is a link to Amazon's uh, official AWS CLI um, uh, configuration reference, and that details out uh, everything I'm going to talk about here um, uh, in in more detail. And it also it will uh, it will give you details about things that are not necessarily supported by the Apercept AWS SDK because they have a lot of configuration options. We try to support as as many as we can, um, but uh, the reality is um, there are so many scenarios of configuration that um, I uh, I don't think at the minute we are quite. Uh, <laughs> quite up to speed with everything. Um, if there are, um, uh, uh, if there are differences, I'll, I'll try and point them out uh, here. Uh, so uh, in the any files, um, in the shared files, they are any files and uh, we can see examples of them here. So in your home folder or your user profile folder, uh, there's a .aws folder uh, and that will contain two files uh, if you have a configured AWS um, uh, CLI or SDK. And it, and the first one, config, is, um, uh, is general settings. So in here, you will see things like um, a region. Um, so here we're seeing that in the default profile, and I will point out that these configurations are organized by profiles and default is the default. So um, if you don't specify a, a profile that you want to use, then uh, it will load this default profile. Uh, and in this case, we're seeing that region is being configured to communicate to EU West 1. So the SDK will uh, will use services in that region. That's uh, that's Dublin, uh, Ireland. For uh, anyone who's not uh, familiar with all of the uh, uh, the region names, um, then uh, in the credentials file in the .aws folder, you will see um, a set of credentials, and these will be credential specific to you. Um, so uh, when you configure uh, your account on Amazon, you will have the option under the Identity and Access Management, IAM, uh, you, you can generate yourself some credentials for use on command line tools and within the SDK. So uh, you would typically come and store them here on your uh, in your credentials file. Uh, so there'll be an AWS Access Key ID and an AWS Secret Access Key. Um, you can override the profile that you load by setting the AWS profile uh, environment variable. Um, and that, that means any applications you launch, if you set that to a different name, um, any programs you launch within that session will, will load a different configuration. So uh, you can also switch those at runtime um, using the IAWS options profile attribute. We'll talk more about that shortly. Uh, so this configuration here is useful for developer configuration um, or deployment to private servers outside of AWS, um, where you don't have another mechanism to, uh, to retrieve um, credentials. Uh, let's have a look at environment variables. Uh, we specify uh, these at launch, if we want to override the behavior of the uh, configuration that we are uh, that we are uh, wanting to run a program under, um, these take precedence over the values that are stored in the shared files, and we support the most commonly used variables, including AWS Access Key ID, AWS Secret Access Key, AWS Default Region, and AWS Region. Um, and uh, AWS profile as mentioned previously. Uh, so these values are useful for injecting configuration uh, into CI or production containers and instances. So if you um, if you need uh, 
uh, a, uh, a continuous integration flow to have access to actual AWS services. Um, often on CI systems, it's uh, one of the easiest forms of configuration is to inject environment variables into a uh, uh, into a process. So we'll uh, in, so this is a good scenario to use these. Um, and, and same with um, production containers and instances. So if you're deploying a Docker uh, service to something like Amazon uh, ECS, the uh, Elastic Container Service, you can uh, you can set uh, values within the task definition, um, uh, including these values to to inject uh, uh, how you want to load its configuration. So let's have a look at, uh, at options and how we make use of them. So uh, when we want to override the default behavior, um, we uh, can create an options uh, class. Uh, we, we typically use an options interface. So uh, in this example, we're still using S3. So we create uh, an options uh, um, on line 13, you'll see it declared as an IS3 options. So that's an interface to the S3 options. On line 18, we're creating that uh, uh, that options uh, TS3 options, and then we can specify the things that we want to override. So on line 21, we have an example here of setting the region that we want to um, uh, uh, use the services of. Uh, lines 24 and 25, we're specifying static credentials. So these would be used over anything that was loaded from the uh, environment that we're executing in. Uh, and then on lines 28 to 32, we're doing the same thing as lines 24 and 25, but this is an example of setting credentials through the credentials interface. And what that allows you to do is provide um, uh, credentials from another source. In this case, we are just using TAWS credentials um, and TAWS credentials is a static credential um, with static values that you provide. Um, it, but in, in a real world application, uh, there are likely other sources of credentials that you will want to uh, to uh, use, say, for example, Cognito. Uh, and we'll see an example of that in, in the later session on Cognito. Um, and then uh, it's important to remember, once you've defined these options, you need to pass them to the constructor of the client uh, that you're uh, going to want to use them. So on line 34, we're seeing that... Uh, uh, the TS3 client is being created with the options. Um, right, and then let's have a look at some more uh, things we can do with uh, options. Um, uh, if we are going to use multiple Amazon uh, clients uh, within a, uh, a session, we can uh, make configurations uh, generic. So um, if if we look at line 14 here, uh, we've got an options i AWS options. So this is a this is a generic AWS options interface now. So when we create on line 21 T AWS options, uh, these options will be honored by any client. So uh, so here we're setting the region on line 22, um, and then on line 25 we are creating an S3 client with those options. And on line 28, we're creating SQS client, TSQS client, using exactly the same options. So they're going to be configured the same. Now, uh, we also have, th uh, this is al almost exactly the same uh, example as the previous example, except for, I just wanted to highlight that we, we have this concept of scoped options. So on line 25, the difference here is we are setting a value for region. We're setting the value EU West 2 for the region for the S3 service. And 
the key thing here is other clients like the SQS client that's defined at line 33, that is going to use the default region here on the options, which is EU West 1. But the S3 client instantiated on line 29, even though it's getting the same options, that will use the EU West 2 region because it's an S3 client. Um, and this, this is very useful um, in scenarios where Amazon, uh, they, they don't have every service deployed in every region. Uh, so uh, a good example of that is uh, Amazon simple email service, uh, which uh, doesn't have a full implementation in every region. Uh, they have a few key regions around the world that that have uh, uh, that have that. So if you want to send emails from your platform, but you're deployed in a region that doesn't use um, uh, that doesn't use uh, or doesn't have uh, its own simple email service you can set um, the region specifically for SES. Uh, and that just, um, it, it makes it easier for you to manage these common uh, sets of options if, if, uh, uh, if, you're, if you have interactions between multiple services within a, within a, a process. Uh, so our, um, when we make a request, each action that we uh, that we make accepts uh, arguments via a request object. So what we see here is we have an S3 client created at 17, and then straight after it, we're creating um, on line 20 a a request object, and this is an IS3 get object request. Um, and that uh, request is then passed to line uh, to get object action of the S3 client on line 25. This is the longhand way to make that request. Um, every action on the uh, within the uh, client has this uh, pattern, um, but. It's obviously, it's not always convenient or it's not always desired. Some actions don't really need any arguments. Some actions have only one or two arguments, as in the case of the get object request, there's only two required um, uh, required uh, arguments, uh, the bucket name and the key of the object that you want to retrieve. So um, instead of creating an object request like a get object request like this, the get object action has an overload which allows you to specify those arguments straight away without creating that. So on line 28, there is a shorthand uh, there which is doing exactly the same thing, uh, but it saves you from building that request. Now, some requests are too complex. They need too many inputs um, to uh, make this uh, sensible. So in those scenarios, we don't provide any overloads. We just leave them as they are, um, and uh, and leave it up to to you to construct the request object as you see fit um, for your for your need. So the on the other side of requests is responses. So. Um, once we make a request, again, we are using the get object request here, uh, and on line 20, we are storing the results of that get object request in the response variable. So that response variable, um, here I'm not defining the type in code, but that will be uh, uh, an instance of is3 get object response. Um, and then uh, once we have a response, um, if no exceptions have happened, uh, we can then interact with it. Uh, we can check if it is uh, considered a successful res uh, response. Um, uh, you know, m most most of the time it will be regarded as successful if uh, an exception hasn't been raised. Um, uh, 
but uh, uh, but there is uh, you know it's it's always safer if you're not entirely sure how the service considers success and failure. Uh, it's always uh, a good thing to check: is this response successful? If it is, then you know that the data in it should be populated, and you can you can interact with it. Um, obviously, each response, each action has a different uh, response structure, uh, and you can you can see that within the SDK's um, help, you will be able to find uh, the interfaces. Um, uh, uh, and what's available um, to you in those responses. So um, let's have a look slightly more detail about the exceptions. So um, any any request that you make, um, you should um, try and handle those exceptions uh, at least like on line 27, we're we're handling the ES3 exception here. So we're saying um, any exception that the S3 client specifically uh, raises, we we will handle here. But on line 23, we're showing an example of handling an S3 specific exception, ES3 no such key. So that is going to happen when you have asked for something for an object on S3 that doesn't exist. So uh, here we're just outputting object not found. Um, now with retries uh, and exceptions, um, uh, we're, uh, there is a policy that is effectively defined through the options. So. Um, here you can see that we're creating an S3 options, uh, TS3 options on line 17. And then uh, we've got some examples here of changing the policy. So uh, so the options retry limit on 21, we're setting it to 10. It defaults to three normally. Um, so that means uh, you will only get, um, uh, you know, uh, 10. In, in this case, you, you would get up to 10 retries. Uh, and at which point it will then fail um, if it's not successful on that retry, on that last retry. Um, the um, uh, option on line 25 where we're setting the retry base delay. Um, so the retry base delay is specified in milliseconds and it's a, it defaults to 300 milliseconds. Uh, it's the base value that is used for calculating the retry delays. So um, it's an exponential back off. So rather than just trying um, immediately after each failure, uh, we put a, a small pause in uh, between retries and that pause gets a little bit longer each time. Um, in case there's a like a, a server issue, like there's too many requests being made and the, the server is saying, oh, no, we can't handle that right now. Um, it, it's best to just give a, a small delay um, and then maybe it will be more successful. Um, and if it still fails, it we get a little bit longer and so on. Um, the uh, online 29, we are enabling a thing called Jitter. So uh, retry Jitter, we're setting it here to full. Um, and you can set it to equal or full to enable uh, retry Jitter. Uh, it defaults to none. Uh, but what this does is if you are building a large scale application and l uh, loads of um, uh, errors happen all at once, say say you've got a thousand servers processing uh, messages off of a queue and they're relying on doing something with another service and they're getting errors from that service. Um, if you, if uh, in the normal rules of retry, um, they will all be exponentially backing off probably all at the same time. So adding jitter in adds a small amount of randomization to how long the delay is 
And that just means that when all of the retries on your thousand servers happens, um, it, it just means that they don't all hit the server at exactly the same time again. And hopefully you won't get uh, a, a service overloaded with your requests. So um, if we uh, if we look uh, on line 35, we're using the same uh, uh, or, or we're using uh, the the um, ES3 um, slowdown exception here uh, to catch when there's too many slowdown responses. Now, slowdown is marked as a retriable error. So, if we've got retry limit here set to ten, we're not going to see this exception for the first um, uh, for the first ten times that this. Um, fails. We're only going to see it after that. So once it gets to its retry limit of 10, you are then going to get an exception um, of, uh, of that raised. So uh, utility classes that we provide. Um, this is an example of, uh, of a policy document model builder. So uh, with um, Amazon Web Services, you are almost certainly at some point going to be working with policy documents from the Identity and Access Management uh, Service. And um, what policy documents are? They are JSON documents that uh, have a, a defined structure um, that allow you to define permissions um, and and the scope of permissions for services and for uh, uh, for users interacting with those services. So um, rather than making you uh, write lots of JSON code or uh, uh, or do lots of string interpolation, injecting values in, when you want to programmatically generate a, a policy document, you can import the aws.iam.policy document, and then you can use uh, the tiampolicydocument.build uh, which gives you a fluent interface here um, to generate that document. And here with our program, uh, it just outputs, or it would output some JSON uh, like the JSON on the right. Um, and you could say, oh, well, it's um, uh, <laughs> there's probably more lines uh, of code written on the uh, in the Pascal code there than there are on the JSON. But it, you know, the aim is for it to be uh, a more uh, a, a, a more defined interface specific to this document type, um, so you know what values are allowed where, or what or what values are expected where. Um, so uh, let's jump straight into having a quick look at the S3 Explorer demo that is provided in the uh, in the AWS SDK samples repository. Uh, we'll just have a quick tour around um, and uh, and see some of these things we've been talking about in action. So here in Delphi, I've got the S3 Explorer demo from the AWS SDK samples repository open. I'll just quickly run it for you so you can see uh, the idea of what it does. Uh, if um, we select from this list one of the buckets uh, in my account, I've got AppSet demo one here, and I can navigate through this in an, S uh, in an Explorer-like interface uh, where we can navigate through the, the folders and uh, and we can inspect files. So, so here's uh, uh, the AppSet wallpaper file. It's 2.15 megabytes in size, um, and uh, yeah, uh, we can see it's located in the AWS region EUS2. So, it's uh, it's quite simple. Um, we also have the ability. Uh, let's have a look here uh, to upload. Um, so if we just upload the AppSet wallpaper here, oh, there we go, we're done. So uh, that's a uh, that's a relatively small file. So um, 
uh, it was done uh, very quickly. Uh, but I'll show you what happens if we upload a larger file. Uh, so we've got this uh, video here that's 192 meg in size. So if we open that, uh, we can see, oh, what is happening here? This is uh, giving us lots of progress bars and they're all happening at the same time. Um, so if a file is very large, it's good practice to break it up into um, smaller parts and do a multi-part upload. So um, the AWS SDK has built-in methods for handling this for you. Um, and, uh, and I'll show you how that, uh, that works. So first of all, I'll just have a quick note. If we go into, uh, uh, into this change bucket method, um, the first thing I wanted to know was uh, when you're um, when you're interacting with a uh, with a bucket, you need to have a client configured for the bucket's region. So each bucket is located in a region, um, and you you need to configure a set of options for that. So this uh, the client that we have here is configured with whichever region that we. Uh, that our SDK is configured with by default. Um, but we use this get bucket location method um, to retrieve uh, the, the, the bucket, the selected bucket's location. One gotcha here is in the response, the location constraint, which normally specifies the region, if it's empty, it actually means the uh, region is US East 1. Uh, so that's a nice little gotcha if you're not used to dealing with Amazon S3. Um, but then once we've configured some options and created a client for the bucket, we can use that uh, that client to talk to that bucket. So in in this, we create an F bucket, which is a TS3 bucket, which is a model um, for um, interacting with the bucket and it has convenience methods and I'll, I'll show you more about what we do with that now. Um, if we jump down to change prefix, change prefix is effectively the equi equivalent of a change directory command and all the change prefix does is it updates the user interface, it clears uh, the objects out of the user interface and then it refreshes the objects based on the on the new prefix. So if we go down to the refresh objects uh, method, uh, we can see here um, what this does. First of all, it lists um, the objects um, and we configure the request to have a delimiter. So if we see here, there is a request delimiter of slash. And what that does, it tells the list objects request um, to uh, consider that the slash part of the key is a delimiter for effectively uh, directories. Um, so while S3 isn't really a file system, it's a it's a key it's a key blob store uh, for objects. It's um, uh, you can you can fake some file system like behavior using uh, the delimiter. And uh, and what once you configure a delimiter, um, the response of list objects will return to you uh, what it calls common prefixes, and they are uh, at the level of the directory that you have queried. Um, uh, 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 what uh, what what folders are within there? So I then have a method in the form here to render prefixes, which will uh, effectively create the directory structure. Um, and then here's where we use the bucket object that we were uh, that I mentioned um, uh, earlier, which is we use it to retrieve the objects. Now objects are limited to a thousand objects in a response. So if you're if you have more than a thousand objects in a response, you're going to need multiple requests configured um, uh, with the correct uh, uh, tokens to paginate your way through the whole bucket. Um, so as a convenience, um, the bucket object, the IS3. Um, 
uh, oh, TS3 bucket object will uh, allow you to iterate through objects, all the objects of a uh, uh, of a bucket um, very conveniently. So it's not necessarily the most efficient thing you want to do um, if you're dealing with large um, uh, S3 buckets uh, with large amounts of objects in. Uh, you probably don't want to to do this. You will probably want to make uh, more focused requests uh, to list objects. But in this um, in this scenario, I'm, as a demo, I'm just showing you that it's it, it is possible. So let's um, let's now have a and jump over and have a look at the file uploads. So here's the file upload form that handles uploads, and this is the upload file uh, method within this form. Um, so first of all, I'll note that uh, I run, using ttask run, I run the actual upload method um, in uh, the upload file method here, uh, is running a background thread. Uh, so this won't block the user interface, so it will stay um, uh, responsive while this upload happens. Um, the um, uh, I should note uh, note as well that just like the bucket object we, uh, the, uh, that we had, there is an TS3 object uh, model that allows us to interact with a specific object, and we use that because it has a convenience method here for uploading a file, which just takes a file path on your file system, and it has a boolean flag here whether you want to use um, temporary files when if it needs to um, split it into multiple parts for upload do you want to use temporary files which can reduce uh, the amount of um, uh, memory pressure uh, on your uh, on your process and then uh, this uh, next argument here is a callback procedure and this callback procedure is going to be called every time uh, data is transferred with a uh, series of um, uh, of values uh, for the current state of the upload. So what we do here is because we're in a background thread, so like I say while this isn't a part of the AWS SDK it's worth noting if you are working in a and a GUI application, it is good practice to, um, to, to put these things into background processes. Um, and we queue this method back onto uh, the, uh, the main thread um, for GUI updates. And it's because inside here, we are calling um, some updates, uh, like we're updating this overall progress bar to the overall values. Um, it, and we are then calling this update part progress, which is a method uh, which locates the part that uh, um, that should hopefully exist in the user interface. If it doesn't, it will create a new uh, progress bar for it and place it in the user interface uh, and set the values for it appropriately. Um, and there is a final argument here, which is a variable argument uh, to this callback, which is um, an abort flag. So if you set this to true, um, the the uh, uh, the upload will abort. Um, uh, so that is um, taking care of a lot of complexity for you in how to go about breaking up files, how to go about uh, uploading them to S3, uh, whether, whether it's a single chunk or whether it's multi-part uh, to be more efficient. Um, it, it's it's helping a lot here, um, uh, making your life as a developer hopefully a little bit more easy. Um, uh, so th this, it, like I say, this demo it is worth exploring uh, and experimenting with. So I, I do encourage you to go and check it out uh, from the uh, uh, sample repository um, and have a play for yourself. So uh, that has been get is getting started with the Appercept AWS SDK for Delphi. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us and uh, please um, you can contact me for any feedback uh, uh, at support at appercept.com 
uh, you can uh, follow us on Twitter on Appcept HQ. Um, uh, feel free to tweet us uh, with your <laughs> feature requests or, well, maybe email uh, feature requests. Um, uh, and then uh, t uh, please take a look at the uh, GitHub repository, Appcept slash AWS SDK Delphi samples uh, for uh, the S3 Explorer and other samples that you uh, will have seen here. Um, uh, the QR codes in the uh, on the top of the screen. One is to appcept.com, uh, and the other is to uh, the Get It uh, package uh, containing the Appcept AWS SDK. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, great stuff. And uh, the good news is that Richard is with us live in the studio, as if by magic he will appear just there, probably. No, there, there. Oh, I was right first time that way. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> Hello. Yeah, good, thanks. How are you doing? I'm okay, yes. Uh, I read, never read emails when people are moaning about something. I just uh, I made a mistake of doing that. Thought, oh, wait, I'm going live to do the link. So uh, great, great uh, session. Um, I did uh, do something yesterday, the space computer, which actually used uh, your components. And I have to say, I uh, hadn't got around to doing much with them before I looked at them, and I've been in meetings where we've talked about them actually quite a lot. Uh, but uh, but using them, I found very easy. I think the only thing I would probably say is that people, and I think even you've mentioned this, sometimes people expect to see components they drop on the form or something like that, yeah. and and it's actually an SDK, so um, you're including it. I think that's the yeah. So uh, yeah, so I saw your demo yesterday. Uh, there was a really nice effect on the uh, uh, on your um, space computer. Uh, yes. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, but uh, yes. yeah. <laughs> And some McKeith has left the uh, bridge or something like that. I think it was the one of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I really, um, yeah, with, with the SDK approach, I, I, I tackle it from this is what the official Amazon Web Services SDKs are like. So I, I try to replicate the, the feel of their SDKs. Um, and I know with Delphi, we, we like RAD. We, you know, we want some nice RAD components. Drop things on and off it goes. Yeah. And th there, are, there, there are a couple of components already, and you'll see uh, those uh, for anyone tuning in tomorrow for the Cognito session. You'll see, uh, you'll see a component called T Cognito Hosted UI. Um, yeah, how many, how many sessions have you got? Because I seem to remember uh, you were being super keen and said three or four. Is it three or four or...? What, what uh, you I, into I doing? think you, yeah. I mean, I said, uh, I said, blase. I'll, I'll do as many as you like. But, <laughs> but, yeah, that was um, a mistake. Yeah, <laughs> you never yeah. do that. I did uh, that. And that's uh, yeah, so time, <laughs> so I've got three sessions. This one, uh -oh. uh, one tomorrow on Auth Made Easy with Cognito, and on Friday we've got um, uh, we've got one which is extending uh, into the cloud or extending an existing platform into the cloud. Uh, yeah. which is okay. how, so to, actually, how to take an existing platform and try and move it, uh, parts of it into the cloud, make use of cloud services. Well, for those of the the people that uh, actually liked this session, it's on at the same time tomorrow, your other session, just by coincidence, I think. Um, so if they tune in at the same time tomorrow, they'll get it again. Um, if they scan that way, if they scan this uh, little QR code here, um, hopefully I'm pointing to it, the preview says I am, uh, it will go to your website, and they can also get your your components and uh, well, the SDK should I say from uh, Get It, which you mentioned in your videos as well. But um, we haven't got a huge amount of time to talk. But I just wanted to thank you for putting a lot of effort into it. Um, I mean, everybody that uh, contributes is is um, is uh, you, you know putting a lot of effort in. But you particularly by being crazy enough to say yes when I said, oh, I'll take a few sessions. Um, you know, I know how much work that is. It's a ton of work. Every hour that people see, several hours of preparation and recording and things like that. So, uh, yeah. you know, from Embarcadero and from me personally, thank you for doing that. Um, I'll just uh, put up a few little things like this one here. 
um dr kevin bond who's uh, quite a well-known uh, guy um not not far from you i think actually um who uh, basically okay. wrote the book on all sorts of software development but uh, he said a really useful overview so you got the thumbs up from dr kevin and uh and uh, several other people as well said the same thing and somebody talking about apache dark arrows i don't know what was going on there that was to do with your cursor i think your cursor because, caused some... because i my screen recording was the software use enlarges the cursor anyway and then in post editing I zoom in to the right. bit I want. So, yeah, it was a, a slightly oversized cursor. Sorry. Proper professional. You see, zooming in and everything. I used to zoom in, but I, I just life's too short now. I just, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't do that. I'm like, oh, well, I wanted to make sure the text was readable. So, you know, yeah. I yeah, think I achieved that. that. I, I hope it did. Yeah, it was a great presentation. And uh, despite your, what was it, yeah. Latvian Swedish accent or something like that, that uh, I had to explain to Holger when he asked what your accent was. I thought it was quite funny. <laughs> I think Flat Midlands accent, I think. <laughs> That's what it is, yeah. Well, I, I lived for a long time in Coventry in uh, Warwick and Leamington, so... Uh, yeah, I'm used to the Midlands accent. My my accent's a mixture, so it's uh, it's American, British, something else. So, so it's cool. Okay, well, uh, you know, thanks a lot. Uh, we haven't got a lot of questions specifically about that, but Cognito tomorrow is a very interesting session, and I actually want to watch that for my purposes. So um, thanks for sticking around and thanks for um, taking part. And uh, we'll see Thank you again tomorrow. Okay, thanks a lot.